So uh, this is Duncan Green, uh, recent, uh, well, author of From Poverty to Power, as we have here. Um, Duncan, we, I'm Andy from Practical Action, uh, and I'd just like to ask you a few questions about the book and about your thoughts on some of the issues that are raised in the book, and um, just get some of your thoughts on uh, right, no sort of development in general. Um, so at the moment, you talk about how, uh, in the book, how technology is dogged by issues of power and politics, um, and that that sort of hampers poor people to, to uh, reach their capabilities, really. Um, is giving poor people access to appropriate technology something you think should be a global priority? Yes, uh, I think giving poor people access to technology in general should be a global priority. Technology is a crucial driver of development. Um, I was in Ethiopia last year talking to farmers who had no running water, no electricity, but they had mobile phones, and when you ask them, What's the impact of the mobile phone? They said it saves me phenomenal amounts of time. If I think my parents are sick, instead of walking three hours there and three hours back, I can call them. So those kind of things transform people's sense of well-being. There's a clear case for appropriate technology and that sort of sense of small is beautiful technology, but there's actually a sense for a case for lots of other technologies. Um, the point the book is making is that technology is not neutral. Often politicians grab at a technological fix because they think it doesn't involve difficult choices, but technology is always designed, created, and then implemented according to power relations, and that affects how much good it does or how much damage it does. Okay, so practical action talk about small and beautiful in terms of technology. That's something that you don't necessarily think is... I think sometimes small is beautiful, but actually sometimes small is stupid, actually. You want to reach a lot of people. You've got a billion pe two, two billion people without energy. You want to reach them quickly before they'll die. Um, so sometimes small is beautiful means Let's have the technology that is best suited to those people. Um, but actually, you often want to go to scale very quickly. So I think, you know, I, I, I wrote a blog post recently um, saying, so what distinguishes a nice technology from a nasty technology? And uh, Initially, I thought it was completely random. But actually, when I looked at the kind of technologies NGOs like and the kind of technologies NGOs instinctively dislike, there is a logic to it. The, the ones they dislike are big scale. You know, the, the ones where... They're not sort of dispersed amongst the population. They're designed through big R&D spending, which may not take poor people's issues into account. But actually, you know, I think things like the motorbike or the motor car um, uh, have had a huge and positive effect on people's lives. Um, mass for mass generation of electricity the same. So it would be false to make, take that argument too far. You can do big things well. Um, so I wouldn't always say small is beautiful. In order for many technologies to be effective in lifting people out of poverty, uh, poor communities need to be able to access energy. I mean, it's mm -hmm. fundamental, really. The UN have got a goal of bringing total energy access for all by 2030. Um, and the UN seeing, see this as being private sector led. In, well, historically, it's been that sort of thing has been driven by governments, total access to energy. Is that something that Given that context, do you see that, that goal being reached if it's being private sector led? Well, first, as I, I once studied physics a long time ago, and I like the idea of seeing the world through the lens of energy. That mm -hmm. makes absolute sense as a, as a physicist. Um, in terms of energy for all, I think it's a really good uh, aim. I think it's clearly missing in the current development landscape where we look at all the things that energy can produce in terms of you know, homework and education and um, you know, possible water and that kind of thing. Um, so all that's right. In terms of the balance between private and public, I haven't looked at energy in particular. What, what you can see in general is that it really varies according to the sector. So privatization of telecoms has actually worked rather well in many countries. Privatization of roads tends to be a mess. Um, so the question really is where does energy fit on that spectrum? And a useful way to do this if you, is to go back and look historically, as you just did, and actually say, okay, well, how did Korea do it? How did Taiwan do it? How did Malaysia do it? And then going further back, how did Germany do it? How did France do it? And then we could have a useful discussion. Normally, these discussions take place in a historical vacuum. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I've just been working on a, a really interesting study by Harjun Chang of looking at how 21 countries developed in terms of their agriculture. And you learn loads of stuff which isn't in the, in the script now. Yeah. He did the same previously on industrial policy. It would be very interesting to do one on energy. I haven't seen that work, but it, it, it may well 
you know, what, what the agriculture one shows is that actually the balance of private and public, which produces takeoff from agriculture, is more mixed than it is in industry, where industry tends to be much more yeah. state led in the early stages. So I don't know what they'd find on, on, on energy. No, and presumably that's what you would want to see before yeah. you would make a. We certainly want to use on. history, should at least help us a bit. Yeah. And just yeah. quickly going back to technology, where you, were, you, you sort of said the small is beautiful isn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, developments like the motor engine, cars, motorbikes, or large power plants can bring development. Does development and climate change, are, are they easy bedfellows? <laughs> <laughs> now that's a leading question. <laughs> um, so we had a really interesting discussion in Bangkok last week, in fact, um, where the guy from the European community basically stood up and said, can we allow the Chinese to have cars? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was a brave thing to say, I think, um, politically. <laughs> um, and what you can see is that if your task is redistribution of the basic means of having a dignified life, you can do that without a big impact on planetary boundaries still. Yeah. You can, you can, the, if you gave energy for all, it would add 1% to global yeah. carbon emissions. So actually, you shouldn't let climate change inhibit that ability, that, that urge to create a sort of basic floor for everyone. You should look much more at people at the top of the, pi the pyramid because they're the ones who are doing the polluting. And it would be a real perversion if we started, if we said, okay, the first people who should make a sacrifice to sort out climate change are Kenyan flower farmers um, because we're worried about food miles or flower miles. And the, the, while we're thinking about maybe sorting our, our own house out, we're going to you know, take a million jobs away from East Africa. And that's the kind of bad direction that climate change and food miles kind of conversations can take you. We need to keep a sense of who's actually the problem here and what are they going to do about sorting it out. And that rapidly means you can have energy and a basic level of development locally. I suppose the, uh, the question almost goes back to when, when countries reach that level where they're like China, yeah. like Vietnam, like Malaysia, where they're at the level where they start to want that's where it's middle, got middle income. Yeah, and that's where it's got much more complicated yeah. over the last five years because, you know, prior to the uh, Copenhagen Climate Summit, there was this rather crude distinction between rich countries have to do everything, poor countries have to adapt and get help. And, and people sort of didn't notice that there were a lot of countries in the middle, including some very big ones. Um, China's now up to 4.5 tonnes per capita of, climate, of, of, of carbon emissions, which is slightly above the global average and way above what's sustainable. Yeah. So, you do have to have a low carbon transition. It can't wait until a country is high income. Um, and that is a really, really difficult challenge. Uh, but you can't just take defense, take sort of Indian defense. Indian government sometimes says, it's not our problem, you created the problem, we'll think about it when we're rich. That doesn't actually work within the current planetary boundaries, but it's a very tricky issue in terms of fairness and justice and historical responsibility. Any suggestions? Um, Start with the Australians. Okay, so the Australians are producing 19 tonnes per capita, so they're the people you should take the first hit. Uh, when they get down to 10 tonnes per capita, you'll have a much stronger moral case for talking to the Chinese and, below, you know, and after them the Indians and the Kenyans and all the rest of it. Um, I did a calculation just to annoy people on the blog a couple of years back. The, uh, the typical emissions from a British dog are twice as high as the typical emissions from a, an Indian person. So I think we've got to get rid of dogs. You know, there's a whole load of, uh, yeah. of um, sort of rhetorical stuff we need to get out there and say, this is a justice issue. Technology is going to play a part. You know, my personal feeling, and this is where we get into a very difficult technological discussion, is that politics cannot deliver the collective action, cannot solve the collective action problem that is climate change, and we will end up with geoengineering of some kind. Now, we can either say we don't like geoengineering, uh, we will oppose it because it's new and big and nasty, it's definitely in the nasty technology camp, or we can engage with it and say, our analysis suggests that there will be an inevitable use of geoengineering at some point, and it's very unlikely to benefit poor people. What are we going to do about that? Um, very similar to the discussion on geo. You, know, you can go to, uh, people don't like mudding the water by saying there could be pro-poor GM or there could be less evil geoengineering. If you don't do that, you basically abdicate your, seat, your, 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 your position in the discussion such as it is. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are difficult difficult things, but I think geoengineering is going to come.
I don't see a political solution to climate change.